Hi, everybody. Before we get to another great interview, we could really use your help. IMDB, which is the entertainment database, recently named the Two Opinionated Podcast one of its top 100 podcasts. This is a monumental feat for this program. You know, we're a father and son team out of a small town in West Virginia, have been doing this for about five years. There's 15 million podcasts out there. About 40,000 of those get to the point that they're listed on IMDb. Out of those 40,000 out of the 15 million, we are ranked number 82. Something that we're just immensely proud of. We're so thankful for our listeners, our watchers, our fans. Thank you so, so much. If you would like to help us out and we're asking for it, please. Um, it's easy. It's real, it, it's really easy. It's free. If you go to IMDB, that's IMDB.com, look up two opinionated podcasts and just take a look at the page. That's all you have to do. I mean, you're welcome to look at the cast, look at the episodes so you can kind of see who's been on the program. Do whatever you want, but even just bringing up the page, imdb.com, Two Opinionated Podcast, bring up the page, look at it. That helps us so much. So please, if you can do anything, we would really appreciate that. Um, our YouTube channel is MeisterCon Pod. Love to have your subscription there. It's also free. And you can also check out our website, MeisterCon.com, where you'll find almost 700 episodes, audio and video, available on there. There's also a terrific blog from Brett, and it'll let you know anything that we have going on in studio, if we're covering a convention, if we're going on location, anything that we have going on will be on the website, MeisterCon.com. Thank you guys so, so much. We appreciate you so much much. I, I can't express enough how appreciative we are of all of you. We never, never expected to, to do as well as, as we have, and that's all because of you. Thank you so much. Enjoy that interview. Bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition to Opinionated. I'm so excited today. I've got actor, writer, director Bradley Stryker with me. So welcome, Bradley. How you doing, bud? It's good to see you. <laughs> We've been working on this forever. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think I think that should be all we talk about is the the process of getting here. <laughs> We're like, you know, the you make a film and you think you've got you know the hard parts done, you're all that, and then you realize you still have post and you gotta you gotta market it, and yeah. it's just it takes a long time. That's that's kind of where where we thought we we had it, and I messed it up. And then you had to miss, and then here yeah. we are. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm telling you right now, it's like you're talking about making films. Getting this thing going was worse than that. You could make a whole <laughs> film at the time we took us to meet up. It was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> just, yeah, man. that's the truth. <laughs> you know, I've been a fan of yours for, for a long time. You you tend to pop up on, like, all the shows I watch. And it's oh, one that for years. Like, I, like you go back. Uh, I remember you playing a vampire on Angel. Yeah. Yeah, I did. How many years ago was that? Ah, it's it's a what twenty years ago. Well, that's the, that's <laughs> the thing. With that's the, as you're uh, you're alluding to the uh, the real trick is to somehow stick around for twenty five years like a maniac, <laughs> and then people are like, "I've seen you in a hundred things." I'm like, "I know, I've been doing it for twenty five years. I didn't yeah. get my head checked." <laughs> <laughs> well, you were on Fringe. You were on. You were on the OC. I didn't even watch that, and I knew you were on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People talked about that a lot. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, doing, yeah. For, doing it for quite a while. I, I I rather enjoy it if I'm being honest. But it is interesting because there'll be times like, you know, my wife being Canadian, so we drive across the border a fair amount. But one of the things that's funny is when you drive across the border, they'll always be like, "What do you do for a living?" <laughs> and it always happens when you're going into the states. So you go oh. for us to be driving into the state of Washington, and they'd be like, "So, what do you do for a living? I'm an actor." Well, what have I seen you in? And I'm like, and you it, gotta it's, prove you're an actor. It, it, it's very funny because I'm like, I can't answer that question because I have no idea what you watch. And they're like, what? And I was like, if you go on this thing called IMDb and look me up, you could see a bunch of credits in there. 
and uh and then it'll be like you can tell like, me oh, what i what you see me in feels a little bit arrogant almost to say but you're like there's there's plenty to choose from but go ahead and do the and sometimes they'll be like mm. what's in it oh my god okay wow okay you have been busy and i'm like i told you i can't tell you what do you see what you could have seen me because i don't know the show i don't know if you watch fbi or svu or angel or smallville i have no idea loved you as dead shot i thought you were terrific all right thank you did you know that was ironic because i auditioned for that show how long did that show go 12 or 13 years it went oh, it was on forever and i auditioned for years and then i finally get a role in the last season and they had so many plans for deadshot and we they snuck him into two episodes the show ended and then arrow started the yeah. next year and i ended up coaching an actor i know uh on the part of deadshot for the audition and I was laughing. I was like, his audition had no lines because it was this you know, um, Mike Rose name. You know, this supposed to be this muscular, tatted up guy, totally different character. Yeah. He ended up getting the part. And I just remember laughing and going, this for me was two episodes. Now they scrapped the show. They start over. Now this for you is going to become a thing. And sure enough, it became a thing. And yeah. I was like, oh, my goodness, look at you. Look what I did there. <laughs> you, Yeah, you started that. Well, I mean... You know, it, it was interesting, though, because I was the first live action one. And then I think second was either Mike or Will Smith. Because uh, it was yeah, it was probably you know, Mike and then Will. And then Will, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. They, they realized, I think, this is an underutilized, fun character. And like yeah. they didn't know. My guy was kind of like a cowboy guy. And then all of a sudden, he was a sniper. And I think Will's was a combination of the two. Who knows? Um, yeah. Anyway, it's really fun, to, as you know, as a, I'm sure a fan, but it's fun to play with all those things. Uh, oh yeah yeah well I'm a, I'm a comic book guy that's that's you know back in the 90s i owned a couple of comic book stores still probably the best job i've ever had <laughs> sure isn't that funny right <laughs> you know it's a great i always say it was a great job for a single college guy you know sure. my own stores i just answered to me it was great once i got yeah. married and started raising a family not the best a little a little tough a yeah, 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 a little tough. And also when you're going to work and the wife's like, you want to play again? You're like, no, it's a yeah. job. No, it's a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh -huh. so then, you know, she thought she missed all this nerdy nonsense stuff. And then I started a podcast and she's like, ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. The nerdy stuff ain't going away, honey. It's who I am. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, so Bradley, let's start this way because you've been doing this for a little while. What got you into acting? Why'd you want to go into a business that's so difficult? Oh, I know, right? Uh, you know, I went in kind of pied like anybody else. Actually, I had an experience where, because I, I didn't start acting until I was in my 20s. My yeah. early 20s, I there was a summer in between junior and senior year of college where I was found myself in New York for a summer doing some stuff and ended up taking some acting classes and ended up, I was actually out there to do like print stuff. And then all of a sudden I was like, that's ah, not for me, but I really do enjoy the... Uh, acting stuff so i took a couple acting classes i was like that was interesting and then i went back to school in san diego and ended up taking a, a like a drama 101 class because i still needed an elective right and i had this sort of euphoric out-of-body experience in there during my was doing my final for the class doing a monologue it somehow grabbed a hold of me emotionally and then all of a sudden my classmates were all being infected by this thing that was happening with me and yeah uh I walked out of there kind of dazed and I was like, Oh, I think that's for me. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I graduated college in, I remember June of 1999. And the day I graduated, I packed up my Nissan Maxima in San Diego and drove to LA. And I basically started the next day. And it's, it started, it crossed over a little bit because I had been auditioning for commercials and stuff in college, but the rest was just like, that was what it was going to be. And I was, I've always been somebody that would make if I make a decision, I'm going to do something. I do it a thousand percent, and if I ever stop doing it, then I stop a thousand percent. Right, I but get that. Really, um, and it's it's something that for you know 25 years has held not only held my interest, but it's kind of kept me hungry and uh, intrigued. So uh, that was that's how it got started. But mm -hmm. really, it's the more of the miracle is, is why I'm still doing it. Cause there's a lot of other things I could be, you know, that I found along the path of life or whatever. Some <laughs> of them I've incorporated along with. Right. Right. Directing, but um, the whole idea of film and TV and telling stories and um, 
whether it be in front of camera as a writer, as a director, it's all things I'm very fascinated with, which is not really a surprise because I love watching movies. I'm a yeah. obsessed. So um, I just decided to take that obsession with like, what is this and turn it into my uh, my life. So here I am. I, that sounds pretty great to me. I I mean, I know it's a difficult journey, but you're doing something you love. That's not terrible. It's not terrible at all. And, and you know, if I be you know, honest, it is incredibly difficult. Like it's a, yeah. it's a weird, it's a weird job because you know, the, my mom once before she passed was like, how do you, you basically go on job interviews all day long. Yeah. And she's like, most of us, were, you know, by the time we finish our, whatever our career is, maybe we've been on 10, maybe you right. do like 10 in a week. And I was like, you yeah. And so the irony is also is the jobs we're trying to get are difficult jobs to get. And so you live your life in a perpetual state of no. And yeah, there's a um, lot of rejection. That's why there's a, <laughs> and there's a I, one of my good buddies once asked me, he goes, What's for what's wrong with you actors? I go, What do you mean? He goes, You guys are all a bunch of lunatics. Half of you guys are addicts. And I was like, Well, part of the problem is the way the business is organized. And yeah. what I mean by that is you it's changed for the better since COVID, but originally you spend your day working on your materials, then you drive an hour to your audition, then you sit for an hour, and you go in for five minutes. You do it. You can tell whether they love or hate you, and that don't even matter. And then you leave, and you don't hear anything ninety percent of the time. If you're yeah, good. that kind of stuff. If you don't, it's just a tough life. I and mean, so is, it, is, it, is it better sending in the tapes, or would you rather be in front of somebody? Well, there you go for the catch twenty two. So I'm a quality of life guy. I have a eight year old son um, yeah. who you know, it sounds like you're maybe a parent too, but so my kid sort of trumps all of it he's he's my favorite thing on as he should be <laughs> so anything that takes time away from him needs a reason and a purpose and so yeah. right now i walk from my house to my garage where i'm sitting in my little studio here and i film my audition and you know i work on it the same way i've always worked on it but when i step into here i'm i'm my commute of my 30 second walk to my audition which takes from anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to film what depending on how much material to me going back in there and sending it off is all told 35, 45 minutes. Yeah. Not too bad. It was about three or four hours. So now I get back those three hours to be with him. So I'm a big fan of it. Now, is there things you miss like being in a room and them directing you and being like, great. I see that you think this guy's really forceful. What if he's super gentle? Great. I love that note. Let's try it. So you do miss out on that. And so it's a little bit more of a leap of faith every time. Right. Um, so I miss out on that interaction. And I also miss the people, the being in the room with these people, getting to know them. Uh, but the driving, the waiting, the driving, I do not miss. And so yeah, I think for- I'd be that way too. At, um, and, and yeah, there's pros and cons to both ways. Yes. But at least you got control over what you're sending in, unless you're, you know, like me and, and you just keep trying to make it better and you, it never ends. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so- so one of the things for me, if you put a gun to my head and say, choose it, self tapes is my way. I love it. Quality of life's good. Um, but I'm also fortunate and lucky because I'm 25 years in. So I already kind of know the rhythm of it. Right. <laughs> As a young actor, I'd be a little bit more um, uh, disheart- I would be disheartened by it because the reality is you don't actually, you've never been in a room for that feedback session. Right. Um, but I also know that the things that come with the process of regular auditioning is not amazing. And, you know, LA is being the biggest beast of them all. And LA is a tricky beast because you'll be sitting in a waiting room and you'll look over and you'll be like, Oh man, I love that guy's show. <laughs> and you'll be sitting next to him and you'll be like, Oh great. He's auditioning for the same thing as me. What a waste of time. This is, I don't miss that at all either. <laughs> the head game of it where you're like, Oh, and, there's been, I've seen some crazy stuff in that waiting room. Oh, I bet. Well, and there's no reason to worry about it because you got no control over it and you don't know what somebody's going to, who they're going to choose. It's all a matter of opinion. So okay, I once, I have a great story. I once was, I had done a movie with this kid and it was years later. I saw him at an audition and this is, this is 15 years ago. And he's, He's, we're outside signing in on this thing and it's like a sort of outside inside situation. Yeah. So I'm signing in and he's standing next to me and he's, uh, and he's just standing there and he's just smoking a J. And I'm like, what, I'm like, what are you auditioning for? Cause I'm auditioning for like this serious cop role. And I'm thinking, Oh, he must be one of the bad guys, you know, something like, 
And he's like, oh, no, man, I do this for every audition. I'm like, oh, my God, okay, sure, whatever. Anyway, we have this conversation. It ends up this dude's auditioning to be the cop, too. And I was laughing because always because I was looking at him, and he was just sitting there. He's like, it's, and I'm like, buddy, I don't think you – but the the real story there is is that this is what he did to be able to cope with the stress. Yeah. Because it's a very stressful situation. And That's funny. Um, you know, this my buddy since have has got himself in line, and he's a he's he's uh, been through rehab and stuff. But so, but what was so interesting about the situation is that's how that's how much pressure we used to have in that situation for all yeah. of us, and now that's gone. Um, and it sounds like you know, so it's it's like one of these things where it's like ah, this new way of doing it is much more human. Um, yeah, it's it amazes me that nobody tried that sooner. It's so much easier on everybody. I mean, you do lose the human you know, contact I mean, element. But... This, like when I was 22 years old, black and white headshots were the thing. And I remember being 22 going, well, the place where I print my headshot, they told me it's the same price for black and white or color. So I printed up a hundred of these color numbers and brought them to my people. And I was like, this is great. Right. And looked at them. What are you doing? I was like, this is what we're going to, I want to use those. I think it's, I just think it looks better. It's sharp. It's sparkles. Yeah. They, they said, no, they would they refused to use them. It has to be black and white. It's the, way it's, sense. Always, it's the way it's always been done. So the way it's always been done is the way it needs to be done. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. fine. So I had to you know, throw those and go get some more, whatever. But it was, I found it to be interesting because I was like, no, that's not. So now, of course, we're in the Wild West, and now you got people doing crazy things like yeah. they're filming. Like I've had some buddies that do this when they they actually film an audition like a production, and it's crazy. Yeah, I can see that. That seems like that's where it would evolve to pretty quickly. Well, there's people that offer these services, and you could pay three hundred fifty dollars to film your audition if you want. So it's, I think it's crazy, but the point is, is it's a free for all now. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, uh, that's the 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 one of the disadvantages of sending in tapes. You probably have more competition that way. Well, way more. Not probably. Like yeah. if before they had to schedule time slots, they'd bring in twenty of us because they needed ten minutes for each guy. Now they can ask for one hundred and fifty tapes. Yeah. And they can, when they get your tape, they can. And I know this. I've I've cast my own movies, and I can tell in the first five ten seconds if this person's going to be right for the role. Not if they're a good actor. Like, are they right for the rule? So yeah. what you can do with 150 tapes is get rid of 120 of them, if not 135 of them instantly by being going, great. So here you are going, I just put in the time, did seven pages, worked it all out for you. Right. You watched seconds and looked at me and was like, too young, too tall. Yep. That's why there's certain things that whenever they ask for, can we get your slate at the beginning? I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to let you make a decision by my name is Bradley. I'm six foot, whatever tall and be like done with this guy. Yeah. No, thanks. I put it at the end. It's a, it's an interesting thing. I, I think it's a, it's definitely um, more competitive now. Yeah. Competitive. Yeah. Yeah. So um, your, uh, your episode of tracker aired, I guess. No, it airs next Sunday. Oh, I thought, I thought the second one came out this week. It did come out this week, and they swapped two and three because I. Oh, uh, okay, day. okay, because we were going to watch it this evening. Yep, we'll see. So I, I, had, I had done this. I posted this thing that I'm going to be on the show. Well, when it was so interesting is that they, they then a buddy of mine goes, nope, it's not your week. Your week's next week. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, well, okay. I won't be as I, I'm still going to watch it because uh, the show's pretty good, uh, but I won't yeah, be as, exactly. as, as excited about it i was i was excited because i thought you were going to be on this episode man yeah, no not sunday you can still watch it on sunday all right no I'll, I'll be patient <laughs> <laughs> now the first episode was pretty good good, okay. good i mean i i honestly have just you know i haven't had a chance to do anything between yeah. between family commitments and you know trying to trying to get ourselves up on the mountain skiing snowboard and teaching our kids <laughs> the important it's, stuff is it i mean come on now <laughs> So I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about the sheltering season. Sure. So because this is one that you wrote, directed, and acted in. Yeah. So what's, what's the movie about? You know, and how did you you know come up with the idea? Well, so it's kind of an interesting thing because COVID happens, right? Um, yep. we'll back jump back to that happy time. Well, right before COVID happened, uh, my mother unfortunately passed away. But so yeah. right, that happens, and then we get locked inside, like six weeks later or two yeah. months later. Yep. 
So it's a rough time times two times ten. I'm like the last locked inside. I want to be. It was a very odd, very odd time. And so we we were like kind of figuring out what we were going to do with ourselves. And we ended up going it just it hit bolt back to canada where it's safer you know people so it should be safe my wife about two and a half months in i go i'm gonna lose my mind she's like what i go i can't do that i gotta do so i have to do something she's like what do you need to do i said i think i need to write a movie and we need to make it and she goes and you know she goes here we go again um because we've done obviously it. been through so it before i, I said she has, and she's still here for some reason. <laughs> um, and so I, I had an idea, and I go, yeah, I do. I have an idea. She goes, write it. Sit down and wrote it. Well, simultaneously, a good friend of mine who is a writer, a producer, was she was developing a uh, one of John Irving's books into mm -hmm. a TV show. So she would pilot. She sent me the pilot. Can you give me notes? I gave her notes, sent it off. She goes, what do you got for me? I go, well, I just wrote a rough draft of something. And I go, I draft one of a new movie but i don't want to bother you with it I, I don't share first drafts it's pointless i said let me work on it she goes just send it we're friends you know we're all locked inside what else are we gonna do so, eh, fine i send it to her three days later she comes back she goes how did you think of this and i go well <laughs> it's covid there's there's brand new rules for making movies if we're ever going to make them again who knows right. if we're you know for all we're all going to be dead soon but you know like okay she goes because it was totally bubbled the movie was totally bubbled and uh, she goes, I think it's really smart. I go, oh, and I was joking. I go, you want to make it? And the reason I was joking, this woman's already won a BAFTA for best picture. So I, <laughs> and she goes, I do. And I was like, really? Why? <laughs> Dumb thing to say. I, yeah, and just say goes, thank you. Uh, yeah, exactly. Not why. And she goes, because we're, you know, look look where we are. Look at the state of the world. We're all locked inside. And um, I want to do something with people I care about. And I was like, all right. So we went through a little bit of rewrites, not much. And long story short we ended up moving into production um two and a half months later we were the first movie greenlit first independent film greenlit in canada after covid oh that uh, i didn't know that I mean, that's exciting yeah and the reason we got that is that the woman who was one of our other producers that came on had done the first tv movie so she already finished figured out the protocols and had this massive packet that says here's our safety protocols so when she sent it in to get it approved they're like we already approved this and she goes yeah i'm doing another movie and they're <laughs> like great go have fun so that's how we got circumvent the the story is pretty simple so it was it was kind of wrapped around this idea of isolation right here we are <laughs> locked inside and how can you make a movie under these circumstances and so the movie cut the movie opens up with this married couple who are in different places. The husband's at the family cabin and the wife is at their house. So it's like a little lake house. And there's obviously not doing well. And you come to find out that it's the two year anniversary of their young five year old son's passing. Oh, and COVID. Okay. And she's on it with her friends, their friends that are in other houses in other states, two other couples. And they're getting on it just to try and keep her spirits high. You know, it's an awful day for her. So they want to keep her, keep her in good spirits. And about eight minutes into the movie, there's a knock at her door. She's home alone. She goes and answers the door and the man responsible for the death of her son is standing on her front porch. And so mm -hmm. the movie who the man just so happens to be her half brother who my wife played the woman and I played the half brother and the half brother has been basically booted out from a sort of not mental institution, but a sort of psychiatric place because he he has um, he has uh, uh, schizophrenia and he has been kicked out because they had too many people in one place. So they let the people that were closest to being released go. And so he showed up at her house wanting forgiveness for what he did. And because what you'll find out in the movie is that he had an episode and he actually, he ended up accidentally killing her son. Oh, it's awful. And yeah. She, That's very dark. She's faced with this dilemma of, should I, yeah, yeah, should I forgive him or not? And the entire time this is unfolding, the friends are in the places they can't help, but they're there on Zoom trying to influence the situation. It's not dangerous. It feels pretty amicable because everybody knows him. But the husband the whole time is trying to get home from the cabin back to the house because 
which I'm not going to give this away. He has a secret that only the oh. half brother knows. And so oh, the end of the he worried that three- is he worried he's going to give it away? Yes. Okay. He's worried. He's worried that he's basically the half brother is going to unveil some information that would ruin this man's life, or so he thinks. Uh, it's a so it's very much a psychological sort of uh, thriller, like in a very combustible situation in a house. But it fit all the rules for making a movie during COVID, which is essentially, you know, you have one house, one guy outside, and then two other people in bubbled uh, Zoom calls. Um, it was interesting. It had, yeah, it that's had, a good idea. It has some massive challenges, though, because what you don't realize, if you're doing it like we did, which was in actual separate locations, that the two other couples had to do their entire movie and they're in the entire movie in these other places real fast because we only had a certain number of days. Right. So we like a traditional day in a film is somewhere between like five and 10. If you're being crazy. Day yeah. pages. And I had one of these couples doing 18 pages and 20 pages. Oh my in goodness. Two days back to back. So these are all friends of mine, very talented actors. And so I actually said to them, I said, you need to rehearse this like a play if we're going to pull it off. Because the other thing we knew we wouldn't have to do is move around too much. You just light right. a part of the room and film the things there and then move and film. So because you, you, the other thing about a scene, if you don't have to do coverage and move around, you don't have to move the lights like that. You save a ton of time. That's a big part of the moving in a, a film is lighting this half of the room. Then you switch to this half. Oh, yeah. Minutes, you know, um, so strategically it was possible to do, but only if my actors were up for the challenge and I rehearsed with them ahead of time and all that, and they were up for it. And man, it was, it was really, it was, it was one of those, it was a special situation, sort of lightning in a bottle. And the other thing that was cool is that nobody had had a chance to do what they loved, which was acting for a very long time. Yeah. And I provided this opportunity for them to do it. And so these people showed up not only prepared, but grateful. And the work yeah. changes when it's that. The work changes when it's not how much am I getting paid and when can I go home? The work, so it was this very finite time <laughs> when I got this from these people. And I'm they're professionals and good people, so I'm sure they do it all the time. But I do think there was something a little bit... Uh, I'm sure, because you know, everybody was sitting at home for six months. Yeah, there was something extraordinary for yeah, for every person that got to be part of it. Um, it was really, it was, it was really cool. It was a really funny situation. Now the movie's been doing great. I got picked up by Vertical Entertainment uh, to distribute, and then they ended up placing it at Tubi, which has all been very good for us. Yeah, uh, yeah, Tubi's just, Tubi's a really good streaming service because it does it highlights a lot of independent films that yeah. you might not get to see as easily if they didn't pick it up. I, Tubi's pretty great. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. They make, you know, they make they make a they put some validity behind making independent films, which are, yeah. it's a, as you know, is, is a lot of work for very little benefit financially usually. Um, but it does, you know, I'm going to make movies no matter what. So having these platforms that will help me get it out there, I'm always yeah. grateful. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's definitely uh, changed, you know, having these uh, streaming services that'll, that'll put movies on at a lower cost than say, if you want to try to get it on Amazon or something. So, I mean, and also like there comes a point at which we we should i've tried not but there comes a point at which we can't just all use <laughs> keep feeding the same beast that is amazon before they agree for planet earth yeah is, you know um, you know you know my big off topic but my biggest issue with amazon and they, i know everybody's got their issue and stuff but but mine is that they run collecting yeah i was a collector growing up and you had to actually go and look for the whatever it was you collected. You know, you had to you had to go and hit shops and go to different yard sales or whatever it is, you know, and find the stuff. Now all you gotta do is go on Amazon and you order whatever it is. It's actually a really good point. I never thought of that. Yeah. It is. Is that it's very interesting as a parent because you're raising a children now that don't know a world without it. Yeah. And I mean I recognize the convenience of it and I've tried to get out to not use it. It's almost impossible. And I find it to be so interesting because you kind of have to, it's, it's not, it's not in a sense of entitlement as much as just like the ease at which things should ha- happen at. And it's quite 
astounding. <laughs> it really is. It really uh, is. Because, you, you know, it, it also kind of, along with uh, Walmart and some of those places, it kind of killed the, you know, the individual businesses, you know, the, the small businesses. I mean, it's, I've, I've been victim as Danny. We have a local toy store here in Venice that we had, none of us want to close. So we all go buy all the birthday presents for the, <laughs> and it's, you're paying, you're paying a 30% to 50% premium on everything you have to, to buy it in the store, yeah. but to keep it for life. But it's such an interesting choice because you're going, okay, I could get this for 18 bucks over there. And instead I'm going to pay 30 and you're like, wow. Okay, it's not yeah, nothing. Wait, and you can also have it delivered to your house. You don't have to go to the store, and it's cheaper. Exactly. This one thing this store does, which is I think is so smart, they wrap it for you free of charge. Oh, that's smart. Like really, really cool writing on it and stuff. And I, that is something that you can't get to anywhere else. And I don't know if they did it before COVID, or, or I'm sorry, before Amazon, really, or whatever. But it's one of the reasons why you could justify the extra money because you go, but we go to a birthday party, half the gifts are like that because they're all from the same place. Right? <laughs> and it's not a big toy store. It's not Toys R Us. It's a, it's got a finite amount of stuff too. So you're going to get one. That's, uh, that's good that everybody's kind of come together to support them. I mean, at some point we kind of got to if we want to maintain any sort of... Um, There's not many left. I just, I just, this, this it's everything is so corporate these days that it becomes just boring it's like a you know it it, it really it it makes moving to like a small town in montana even more exciting where they have like 10 mom and pops and that's it because that's it. at least it exists man uh it's it becomes redundantly boring like we we don't really shop at walmart and places like that because of where we live but we also don't out of just a choice because we don't necessarily like what the company stands for yeah. for a lot of the, the way they treat their employees and stuff and it's it's just an interesting uh world to live in where you essentially to take any sort of a stance on any of these sort of things it costs you extra money yeah. <laughs> you know? like, and so you gotta you gotta literally pay for what you, you put your uh, money where your uh, principles are a hundred percent man i mean in, in today's world i mean look at it it's like, if you're trying to save money, you're living in the wrong generation. So who cares? <laughs> you know, just go with it. You know, when when I was growing up, we had a a, a Kroger's, a Rite Aid, and a Shoney's. That was it. A truck stop. We had a truck stop. Yeah, that was it. I it was like when we got Taco Bell, it was a big deal. Big deal. And it wasn't even close. It was like twenty minutes away. So yeah. that for a few years. That was like a uh, birthday destination. Yeah, yeah, we can go to Taco Bell for your birthday, no problem. With that, and we get excited about it. Yeah, yes, you would. Yeah, and you know <laughs> now there's there's restaurants every ten feet, at least fast food restaurants. If you want a nice restaurant, maybe not, but you got fast food restaurants everywhere. Well, you know, it was really telling in uh, post COVID in like cities, especially. You know, I can see it here in in LA, and I can see it in Vancouver when I'm up mm -hmm. there and they're sort of more populated areas is the streets where all the shops and restaurants are obviously during COVID, a lot of it's just closed down. Yeah. But here we are on the other side of all this and miraculously the rents have continued to go up. And so the, all the mom and pops that existed in on main street in Santa Monica on, uh, you know, the places there, and when I say mom and pops, I mean, there were mom and pops that are owned by wealthy folks, but it's still just a right. family. Or it was yeah. A, it's just family owned. It'd be like West Forth over in Vancouver sort of thing. Once they close down, the only thing that's popping back up is a chain. Um, yeah, I know. So it's like, upsetting. It's, yeah, we lost, I think I, I'd heard we lost 40% of our non-fast food chain restaurants here during COVID. Yep. And, and, it, and we didn't have a lot to begin with. So it's, you know, for uh, like like my wife and I, we travel quite a bit. And part of the reason we, we like to travel is to eat. You know, we like to go to to nice yeah. restaurants. And so it hurt us when those closed. We're like, hey, we didn't have many yeah. options anyway, but those were a few we went to. So, you know, yeah. I don't I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I guess, well, I guess the answer is to eat at home. Make it yourself. That's what most of us are doing now anyway. Yeah. I mean, make it yourself. Oh, That's what we've been doing. We had to learn to, you know, kind of make those uh, fancier meals ourselves. And it's been kind of fun doing that. 
Isn't it funny? They did the things that you discovered during this, like, you know, even thinking of sheltering season, this, it was interesting because we made a movie that had definite connotations about COVID and it took a while to finish the movie because of the way we made it. But the period of right after we made it for two years, nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to. And then two years later, of course, the movie comes out and it was in perfect timing and sells well and all that. But what's so interesting is that nobody really, everybody always goes, oh, I don't want to talk about the COVID stuff, whatever. And I'm like, but as you just alluded to, a lot of really cool things came out of it too. Yeah. The relationship stuff that came out of it, the learning to cook things that came out of it. Yeah. The people that learned a language, picked up a guitar. You know, I, I wrote a movie and made a movie. It's a like, lot of people wrote books during that time. I think the real trap though during that time was doing nothing. Um, or yeah. you go into, like survival mode where you're like, I just need to get through it. I'm like, not that that's a problem. Good. Some people need to do that. That's totally valid. But coming out on the other side of that, like I saw it with a lot of people in my, in our industry with actors, they came out and some people hadn't acted nine months a year. Yeah. They didn't have nothing. And so they came out, they're like, Oh my God, how do I do this again? And they were rusty and bad because I saw them for auditions for like my own stuff for my stuff. And I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I was like, oh man, you haven't done this in a long time. You're a little time. rusty. And for me, because of what happened with my mom, like I, I was in a I was in a class every Tuesday on Zoom doing the thing. And I, I had to rewire my brain to get real busy because otherwise I wasn't gonna make it through it. I mean, you know, I have a couple of buddies that went down the deep rabbit hole with whatever their favorite, you know thing to drink or smoke yeah. is i'll tell you what i'm like i can't blame them because i get that as a valid option because you just want to yeah just but it's rough at some point it's going to end and then you got to deal with what you've been doing for the last whatever but a few of them are not doing they're still i mean it's been gone done for a while and they're still not doing well so <laughs> you know what i mean i mean they created a real problem for themselves a lot of those people are the ones that are like i really like being at home alone and i'm like okay yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right well you know 2020 uh, although i always say i i'd give it up if we could have just skipped the, you know the pandemic but it was really good for us as a podcast that's really where we came into our own because yeah. everybody's sitting at home nobody told us no you know i just reached out to anybody i wanted to and 90 percent of the time they'd say well yeah i'm just sitting around let's go ahead if you really look at some of the big podcasts that are out there like smart list and armchair expert and stuff these are very successful people with great careers. And apparently all of them are making more money on their podcast than they ever made in front of yeah. the team. You know, I mean, think of the guy who Jason Bateman who created Ozark and apparently he made more money on Smartless than he did on Ozark. And I'm like, this crazy. is bonkers. Like, yeah, it's crazy. I know, well, and, you know, uh, podcasting and that kind of medium is still fairly new, but it's, it's almost like uh, replacing old school radio. It is. And it got, you got super, there's too many of them now. But like, I can't 15 even. 15 million uh, some. You know, it's way too many. Crazy. Well, also, if you listen, I listen, try to listen to a fair amount of them. And you do realize real quick, some people are good at it and some people aren't. Oh, yeah. Most are. That's, I always say that. The, the best thing about podcasting, anybody can do it. The worst thing about podcasting, anybody can do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, because, I mean, truthfully, if you're producing your own podcast, you can just keep putting them out. Like if you think of um, like a, being an actor, for instance, if you really have no idea what you're doing and you're very, you're not good at it, you're not going to do it for very long before you're, right. you're all, it's just going to end for you because there'll be no more opportunity. But when you're just facilitated doing it yourself. I mean, if you don't mind, you know, not having viewers or making any money off of it, you can do that forever. I mean, when we, when my son and I started, that was kind of our thinking. It was like, we don't care if anybody listens or not. We just, want to talk to each other have a good time and then it took off and we're like oh crap yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> now we gotta figure it out <laughs> exactly exactly i love it that's great well bradley thank you so much this has been terrific I, i'm glad we finally got a chance to talk a little bit this i've been a fan of yours like i said i've been watching you since the 90s so for that's crazy man. I, it, it, you know we're you're probably the same way the 90s seemed like it was 30 years ago but also like it was yesterday. I, you know, the, the whole aging thing is, does this to us all though, doesn't yeah. it? You're trying to figure out where you, how you place yourself amongst the, and you're like, you know, I, I'll sometimes my son will look at me and be like, ask me a question and I'll be like, Oh yeah, I was, I was 12 when that happened. And he's like, Oh my God. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> you know, 
Uh, it, I mean, even if I sit here and think I'm 46 and 20, you know, 25 years into uh, this profession, I'm like, wow, how did that happen? Yeah, it happens before you know it, though. It does. It does. It, it, that's the other thing, though, too, I think you can gather from all the stuff we're talking about from like life that's happened or whatever else is like you kind of get one ride. You know what I mean? You get to do this thing once. And I've always been a, the, the sort of person that's like, if I want like, what do you want to do? You want to go skiing? You want to go snowboard? Let's go next week. Let's let's go tomorrow. Yeah, take like, advantage. Let's go, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And I know so many people that are waiting to do the things they want to do until they get older. And, you know, I got to see with some people in my family that had big, big plans for when they retired. Yeah. And then they are not in good health or whatever else happens. And then none of those plans ever happen. And, you know, you learn from watching, right. And from like sort of absorbing, mm -hmm. I've, always been, I've always been a bit of like that sponge to what's going on around me. And um, one of the things that I'm kind of doing with what I do for a living and also just in life in general is I want to uh, do, I want to be active and do things and not talk about yeah. them, which is ultimately why I became a filmmaker because I was, there was a moment in which it was like being an actor is one thing. And you're like, but I only get to play these finite amount of roles. Cause you know, when I watch a movie, the fast benders in or DiCaprio's in, and then I go, man, I'd love to play that part. The line in front of me to play that part is real long. Yeah. So what I say to myself, I'm like, well then make the thing you want to make, but put yourself in it. And so I'm getting to have these experiences just by way of not wanting to sit around and wait. Yeah. And I love that. You're, you're, uh, you're kind of taking control of the situation. You're just making your own stuff. 150 percent and i think there's something to it as a sort of bigger lesson in life in general it's like you know i don't, I don't know how many people that i've met in through my days are like, oh i would love to go to europe and i'm like go <laughs> like it, yeah, it's not go. That, it's not that big of a conversation no matter where you live just plan it out appropriately you ain't gonna need a million dollars to go that's right and just, and just go experience. Uh, it's interesting though, because I do think there's a certain amount of people that it's just it's just lip service. They don't actually want to do anything. No, like that's that. right. That's right. They say that, but they really they're 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 fine. They, yeah, they're they're good. They they're good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, my wife and I decided to do that a few years back. You know, we were kind of that same thing. We're like, I don't want to wait till we're retired. You know, we're gonna be too old to do anything. We well, we we did it this way. We the places we wanted to go to that you actually had more active or activities to do those are the ones we're trying to do now the ones yeah. where it's more sightseeing we're like well we'll save those for when we're older and you're 100 percent right like if you ever want to like you know hike mochi Picchu or something you need to plan it now because it ain't going to be possible when you're 70 you know no. what i mean no uh -uh. no that's a 70 is the time to go to you know you go see stonehenge or you know you you do that time you go see the castles or whatever stuff like that i was like let's wait we'll do that when we're a little so older. Say that, so we're a big football family, and my son yeah. watches the games with us, and he's like, he's got he's, they have so many ads for the cruise ships, and my <laughs> son is just like he's adamant that one of these cruise ships with all the water slides and stuff is going to be the best week of his life, and we do not want to go on a cruise. No, <laughs> my wife and I especially now. Like, yeah, oh yeah, exactly. We're like, you know what, baby, you're going to have to figure out find another family for that one. He's like, what? <laughs> I was like, yep, mom and dad are not doing Not that. on board for that. Not our jam, buddy. Not our jam. Gets locked into a boat with a bunch of people. I'm good. No, thank you. But when you're 80, you might love that cruise. You know what I'm saying? You might. <laughs> yeah. You might. Yeah, we're kind of that way, too. It just doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't, that doesn't appeal to me too much. I love to travel, but just being stuck on a ship, I don't, I don't think I'd like that. I went on a three-day cruise with my ex, and I, I, we had a fine time, but I was done after the first day. Yeah. Yeah, it'd have to be a day or two, about all I could stand. I don't think I'd like really, it. On, like, and it stops at a port where when it lets you off at the port, all it is is like every single person selling like tchotchkes of like garbagey things are all there trying to, because they know all the tourists are coming. Yeah, it's they like, know you're coming. There's nothing authentic about that. No, no, no. That's you know. my problem a lot of times with, uh, you know, certain places that you want to go visit or a beach especially. It gets too touristy, and then who wants to go to that? It's it's. I mean, I live in Venice Beach. It's a perfect example, but it's a it's a, it becomes like <laughs> this is not what it really is, right? When I go to like a small town in Italy, I'm like, I want to know what it's like to be here, not what it's like to be a tourist here, right? So how do you find your way into that? Um, and that just takes some reading and some discovering. I mean, I, I remember one of the coolest things I had when I was in Bruges, Belgium. This is. 
well, man, this would have been 50. No, this would have been like probably set 19 years ago, 19, 18, 19 years ago. Yeah. Me and my ex were walking down this alley and we had this book. She goes, it says at the end of this alley, there's a bar right there. And I was like, see a bar there. It looks like. So we went up and you still couldn't tell, right? You stay on the massive doors and you open one of these doors. Sure enough, tiny little bar oh, that's cool. filled with smoke back in the day. We went in and I was like, what is this place? And they serve monk beer and you're only allowed to have two. Because if you have more than two, you, you just wasn't going to work out for you. And I was like, listen, people, I'm like 24. I can have more than two beers. Oh, no. Oh, no. I had two. I couldn't see, bro. I was like, what are you guys putting in this stuff? So fun. But we ended up in this tiny, tiny bar with the locals. Just locals. I love that. Yeah, you're right. If you're going to travel, you, you need to do research. Don't just count on somebody else to, because otherwise you're going to miss a lot of the cool stuff. Oh yeah, they'll send you to the place on the, the middle of the piazza with the with the serves the pizza that I was just nothing. Yeah, you don't want to do that. No, 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 no. You gotta find a unique place, but well, Bradley, you gotta come back at some point. Hopefully when you come back, we won't have as much trouble. Yeah, yeah well, listen, the trouble's behind us now. We're moving forward. We're smooth sailing. That's right. We're done with that. That's we're right. done with that. So so a couple of little things for uh, before I let you go. Um, anything else you're working on that we can keep an eye out for outside of tracker that your episode comes out Sunday. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I did it. I helped write a movie that I acted in and produced called Thirteenth Round. That'll be out probably. My guess would be summer. Is that a boxing uh, movie. It is a boxing movie. It's a uh, actually a movie about uh, wheelchair boxing. Really? Uh, That's interesting. Yeah, it, it is I didn't even know there was such a thing. There it is. I know exactly. Um, and I, it's called assisted boxing, I believe. And I play a boxing trainer with Parkinson's. So that was a huge challenge. Oh, that's a neat uh, film. Yeah. When's, uh, when's that one coming out? That should be this summer, I think. And then, um, I did a TV movie a little while ago, uh, called, I don't know what it's going to be called. Meanest mommy or something. It's crazy <laughs> story about this woman who actually cyber bullied her own daughter or something. Really? She's in prison right now in Michigan, I think. Um, you always anyway. seem to find kind of interesting shows and movies to do. Oh, you know what? That's my face, my man. People look at my face and they're like, I don't know if we trust this guy. So yeah. I'm, either the bad guy. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm either the bad guy or the guy that you think is the bad guy who's not the bad guy. Oh, you're yeah. the red herring. That's right. So anytime, listen, it, it, back in the day, it was like, I, you know, the, it was when you're younger, you're like, man, I wish I looked like Brad Pitt. Now it's like, hey, man, I look a little bit off. And they're like, that guy's dangerous. Yeah, it works like, for you. That's right. He's, he, I don't know if he's killing people, but he definitely has before. You know, like it's like good. It's so um, that one will be out probably in a few months, but just busy grinding, man, trying to get some of my own stuff. I've sold a few scripts, a couple of them attached yeah. to direct. So it's going to be uh, 2024 started out good. It's going to be a good year, I believe. Um, yeah, it sounds like you got a lot going on. Yeah, last year was tricky. There's, there's also a movie I did called The Greatest Ever. I did it in uh, Massachusetts. We were, were shooting, got shut down for the strike, and then they let us go back to work. And that movie um, is quite interesting. The trailer just came out for it. It's actually the two leads are young women. Oh. Um this movie's got so much heart and from the trailer it looks like the filmmaker steve did a wonderful job and it was a really fun project to be on um it's just one of those movies where you're on a especially with the two young girls who were um they were all in you know what i mean yeah. and there's something about uh that that i give that i'm like all right what do you need from me because it's when you see sort of somebody young that's kind of achieving something and living yeah. sort of a dream there's something pretty cool about that. Pretty magical about that. Yeah, because so, you don't run into it very often. Not with no, you, a person. No, so. I mean, most of Hollywood is a machine, right? This is the opposite of a machine. This is a passion project. Yeah. With a lot of young actors getting a chance to play leads in movies for their first time. And uh, it's pretty magical. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Cool. That's awesome. That was the greatest ever. So that'll be out. I That one should be out this spring, actually. So Yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. that all those sound really good. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's always a, there's I, there's a lot of stuff happening. The the big one that's coming out is called The Order with Jude Law and Nicholas Hoyt. Oh yeah, I'm glad you brought that one up. That one looks great. Yeah, that one, uh, you know, we'll see we'll see what ends up happening. But the, the great director, great writer, cast is absurd. Uh, that should be a very good movie and a true story. Uh, oh really? Yeah, I didn't realize it was a true story. 
It's a true story. It's actually about a group of guys who essentially they're 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 accredited for founding domestic terrorism. Oh, okay. They were a sort of white supremacist group in Idaho that were really good at robbing um, armored cars and banks. And the way they got caught was like barely got caught. They could have got away with it for a long time. And their whole goal was to essentially, in, in a sense, th- overthrow the U.S. government that they didn't trust. Right. So the irony of it is these men were either. It's very you know, uh, topical right now. Well, with everything that happened with the with the Capitol and all that, and then not to get into politics, but to everything that happened there, that for them, some of them that are in jail, would have been the proof that they succeeded. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. The irony of like, I did all the research, we go, we film this movie and I'm like, oh my God, these men are looking at what's happening in America right now. And they are like, we did it. <laughs> because it's a conversation they wanted to start. Yeah. The guy who this movement back then said we're not you know essentially he said we're not going to achieve it yeah but we're going to plant the seeds and now when you see it all coming true it's creepy and weird and terrifying because what these guys were doing was terrifying and then yeah. you know here you go but it, that movie should be really good just i often kind of look to the captain the general our director and say what are they capable of and justin Grizel, who directed this is a uh, he's a special director he's very talented Australian guy, or actually, I think he's I think he's Australian, but now he lives in New uh, New Zealand, or no, he might even live on Tasmania now. Oh, but man. he's a very, very talented director, and so I think uh, in his hands, the, the project's going to be pretty, pretty good, pretty astounding. Yeah, it sounds like you got really good stuff. This is going to be a good year for you. You know, I mean, we're just building. It's like it's a it's for for where I'm at. You know, things are good, but it always get better, can always get better. And, you know, right. I'm sitting in my little den here of where I do all my auditions and everything else and the good, the bad and the ugly all happen right here. It's uh, right. It's just about kind of like for me, it's always like, how can I keep growing? How can I keep stretching and growing? And that part can be difficult sometimes because, you know, like it's you're human. You've hit a wall. You're like, I don't know. Um, you, the thing that usually gets me past that is nothing that happens in here. It's getting out in the world and like, all right, let's do it. Let's go to Bali. I don't know why. Let's just do it. Let's travel let's for do two. it. Or reopen some of the, you know, the uh, perception organs of our brain and go, okay, wait a minute. Let's shake off this like rusty, like this is my life stuff and go, wow, the world actually exists like this too. And when you step back in here, it all becomes fresh again. So. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So, so okay. So, last thing before we go, uh, where can we find you on social media? Uh, my name Bradley B R A D L E Y Striker with a Y S T R Y K E R. You can find Bradley Striker uh, one, I believe, on Facebook, and then Brett just straight up Bradley Striker on Instagram. Yeah, I like the Striker with the Y. That's the correct way to spell it. I think. I mean, you know what? And this is the craziest part. It's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> like, although Bradley Striker, yeah. that that's a good villain name. It is. Oh, listen, I, I grew up thinking it belonged on the back of my jersey when I was going to play professional sports, and then that didn't work out. But the one thing I spent my whole time doing it when I started acting and stuff is that people would be like, what's your real name? <laughs> Bradley Stryker. And they'd be like, no, no, but the real the real name. I'm like, Bradley Stryker. And they're like, okay, got it. You yeah, know, all, like, right. You know, all right. I'm like, no, it's my real name. And they're like, what? there's a whole bunch of strikers out there, actually. There yeah. really is. It's a good, it's a good Hollywood name though, and it be, and because it doesn't sound like a real name. Well, listen, I just wish I was related to the ones who do all the medical stuff. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. The got all the money. That's what I, That's all I want. I want to know if I'm related to them and like, give tap me into some of that. Yeah, you might be able to, you know, take up uh, kind of the drinking at home type situation if uh, if you get connected with them. <laughs> I mean, just nonstop. <laughs> I already tried that, my man. It did not work for no, me. No, that's a bad. <laughs> Nobody should do that. It never worked. <laughs> and by the way, I was really good at it. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you can become pretty good at drinking very quickly. It's not very good. quickly. I mean, I have a, I have a propensity. It's a strong thing in my family, and I just grabbed right a hold of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, say? hey, Bradley, thank you so much. This has been great, and thanks for hanging in there with me. We uh, we finally get through it. Listen, it's a pleasure. We'll do it again sometime, all right, Bob? Yeah, we have to. This has been great. Yeah, hold on one second. That was a, a lot of fun. Bradley uh, Stryker, such a good actor. Um, 
I wasn't lying. I've seen him in so many things in the last 20 or so years, and he's always good. He's just a really talented actor. And I, I have no doubt that he is an exceptional writer and director um, as well. Um, Sheltering Seasons out now. Do me a favor. Help Bradley out. Go and support that. It sounds excellent. Uh, he mentioned The Order with uh, Jude Law and um, Nicholas Holt. Um, that movie sounds really good as well, so keep an eye out uh, as the year goes on. Um, we briefly mentioned that he made an appearance uh, on FBI. He was Eric. Um, he also did, um, let's just run through some of these, Animal Kingdom, Law and Order, SVU. Um, he did uh, Motherhood, um, Fort Salem, Ultra Carbon. I thought he was excellent in. Uh, loved him in Lost in Space. Uh, he did Arrow, he did Van Helsing, um, The 100. The 100, if you've watched the show, the podcast for a while, uh, you know that was one of, when I first started to um, uh, to really get serious about running. The 100 was the show I chose to watch when I was on, on the treadmill because I liked the theme song. So the theme song would kind of get me get me charged up uh, for the run. So, so he was on The 100. Um, he did I Zombie. You know, I'm a comic book guy, so I love that. He was Kenny on there for a few episodes. He was in the Lizzie Borden Chronicles as Skipjack. Um, let's see, Supernatural, of course, he was on there. I mentioned Fringe, uh, Deadshot on Smallville. Um, Psych, he had an episode of Psych. You know, we've mentioned that several times. Brett's favorite show ever is Psych, so, so that was uh, terrific. He did uh, CSI New York. Um, and Stargate Universe. Yeah, I should have asked him about that one because we've had several of uh, that cast has has come on the uh, podcast over the last year. Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, Bradley, staying pretty busy out there, really working uh, hard. Um, we're trying to do that as well, and we can use your support. Oh, and make sure you watch Tracker. Uh, Bradley's episode is this Sunday, so, so check that out. I thought it was... Uh, this past Sunday, I'm going to watch it, uh, the second one tonight, and I probably still will. The show's pretty good. Justin Hartley uh, enjoyed the first episode, but keep your eye out for that one to be out uh, Sunday. Um, Tracker, it's on uh, Paramount, so CBS with that. So you can help us, if, especially if you're finding us for the first time. Um, if you're a watcher, our YouTube channel is MeisterCon Pod. Please just subscribe. It's free really helps us out. We take those subscribers and that helps us to bring in these great guests that we get. Um, if you're a listener, you can subscribe wherever or whatever podcasting platform you're using. Just subscribe there. That'll help us as well. IMDB named us a top 100 podcast. We're so kind of proud of that one. That's uh, so grateful for it. Um, 15 million podcasts out there to, to be named to a top 100 list is is pretty great. Um, if you go to imdb.com, look up Two Opinionated Podcast. Once the page comes up, that's it. That's all you got to do. That helps us out, just that traffic on the page. So imdb.com, Two Opinionated Podcast. And then you can, you know, it'll show you the 800 or so guests that we've had on the podcast. You can kind of go through there. I think you'll be impressed. It's I, I've said this many times, but I would put our guest list up against any other show podcast, talk show, anything. I, I think our guest list is top notch. I, I'm very, very proud of that. So imdb.com, 2 PNA podcast. That's it. It's free. Thank you guys so, so much. You can find all of our episodes, audio and video, on our website, meistercon.com. So please check us out there as well. Till next time. Bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm once again here to ask for your support. It's been a big year for the Two Opinionated Podcast. Back in February, we got to live out a dream, moderate for William Shatner here in our hometown. In May, we passed 100,000 downloads on our YouTube channel, and we followed that up in June with 50,000 downloads on the audio side. We recently posted our 600th episode, which is pretty good volume, for just a uh, father and son operation. You know, not too many podcasts can keep that volume up. We've been doing this now for four and a half years. 
600 plus episodes. We recently hit 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is a really big deal for us because we've always gotten the views but have struggled to get people to subscribe. So that 1,000 was a big deal for us. And best of all, we were recently named one of the top podcasts on IMDb, which is the entertainment database. You know, those that are ahead of us, we came in at number 82. Those that are ahead of us are bigger companies like Disney, mostly Marvel, and Joe Rogan, that type of uh, podcast. So for us, being just a, a small West Virginia father and son podcast, to be in the top 100 out of 15 million, it's a pretty big deal for us. So thank you for everything you've done for us so far. Got a couple little ways, though, that you can help us, and they're free, and they're really easy. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel yet, please go to YouTube. It's under MeisterCon Pod. Just hit subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. really helps us a ton. And maybe even more important, if you could go to IMDB, imdb.com, look up the Two Opinionated Podcast, and just look around the page. Just having that traffic on the page really helps us out. So that's a couple of easy ways that you can support us, even if you're not listening or watching all of the time. And we want you to listen and watch, because I think that our... Our guest list, I would put up against anybody, any other show, podcast, anybody out there. I think our guest list holds up. So please check us out. You you probably will find somebody that you like or maybe somebody that you didn't know you liked but kind of discovered them on there. There's tons of that. If you're into music, we have that too. If you like books, we've got authors on there. If you if you're more into what goes on behind the scenes in the entertainment world, you know, we've got producers, directors, um, video artists, anything you can think of that happens behind the scenes, we've had them on the show. So definitely check us out. Thank you guys so, so much. Until next time. Bye everybody.